have to make sure that the house isn't cash flow negative. You want to make sure you actually understand your investment. And this is where education comes in. If you're not careful, you can end up paying what Dave Ramsey calls the stupid tax. You can end up paying for it. But if you're educated and you can like the, like what Tara is talking about, Tara is talking about here, you, as long as you do the numbers right, it can be very pr- it can be a powerful tool. And it has been for us. It's yeah. the reason why I am, I am where I am financially today. Absolutely. So welcome back to Lessons into Blessings podcast. I'm your host, Tari Thomas. And with us today, we have Jerry St. Pierre. He's hailing all the way from Italy. And he, we're going to talk with him, chop it up with him a little bit more about just how he manages his real estate from afar. Um, and so if you can welcome and give a warm welcome for me to Jerry St. Pierre. Hey, Tari, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be on the show. Awesome. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about why you're in Italy. Give us a little bit about, 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 back your, about your background, just so our audience okay. kind of has yep. a little bit more information to run with. Yeah. I'm active duty military. I've been doing this for quite some time now. I'm a real estate investor. I own a significant portfolio in Georgia. I own the management company that manages them. So it's done my way uh, all the time and I like it that way. I uh, have my ways of giving back. I'm the president of the St. Pierre Alliance. We provide scholarships and performance coaches to students rising from adversity. And so that's a lot of fun. We enjoy doing that as part of our give back uh, program. I currently host a Life and Money Coach podcast, although next year there will be a name change. We're working with my attorney right now. We're looking at some new things and I'm excited where it's going. Uh, but the, the crux of the show is simply this. We build wealth and relationships the alignment way with our head, heart, and hands in alignment. That's going to be the tagline. Yeah, I got a little preview. So anyways, uh, more to come on that. But I'm married. I've been married 21 years. I've got three great children. They're figuring out life. I get to be their daddy. And uh, I am, I'm a very successful and blessed man, not trying to brag, but it's just where I'm at. And I like to help others get there. And I just share my story and tell some of the things that got me to where I am. So that's Jerry St. Pierre. Cool, cool. Well, I love it. You had so much. I couldn't do it. I couldn't summarize it better. <laughs> so you <laughs> yeah, have, yeah. Um, you have, how did you get started down the path of just starting on your real estate journey? Is there something that mm-hmm. kind of uh, triggered your why on why you got started yeah. down the path of real estate? Well, I like to say I bought my first house at 16. Uh, that summer of my 16 year, uh, 16 years old, that summer between junior and senior year, I played Monopoly with my girlfriend the whole summer. And I was obsessed with the game. And I think she got over it pretty fast, but I fell in love with it. And I've been playing ever since. I grew up very impoverished. We did not have as a family. My mom was social security and food stamps. Uh, my brother was uh, disabled. My mom's disabled. And that should tell you a little bit about my background. There's much more to it. Uh, my mom was not only physically disabled, she was mentally disabled. So we're very impoverished. And I remember at a young age, I thought as soon as I could figure out how to not be like this, I'm not. And so when I was 16 playing Monopoly, I said, you know, if it works here, it'll work out there. And so I bought my first house at 21. I got married at 22. I owned a brand new home when I got married. Isn't that cool? I had a prayer. I'm a man of faith. And so when I was in high school, I had a prayer. I said, God, I I pray you give me a house and two cars that are paid for before I get married. So that if my wife don't have a car, when I marry her, I could give her one. That was my prayer. And I bought my first house at 21. I had three cars when I got married. Uh, It says something there. I tell you what. And uh, I've been buying real estate ever since. Uh, It's not that I was a genius or anything like that. My core GPA in high school is 1.2. I learned that when I applied to go to college and they said, maybe you should start off with one class. I said, why? I said, well, your core GPA is 1.2. I said, well, what's full time? They told me four classes. I said, give me four. I'll I'll be all right. 25 now. I'm a little bit more mature. You don't have to be a genius. You just have to know what you're doing and, and put and have the right heart and head composition to get your hands doing the work and your hands will figure it out as you go. And I've learned a lot. But now I'm able to manage my portfolio from anywhere in the world, and uh, and it does very well for me. So that's a little bit of the story of how I got into real estate. 
Okay, so I'm gonna take take it back because we want to unpeel and peel back some of the layers because our audience always wants to know. Okay, that was yeah. a lot, but we want to know how you got there, right? So yeah. if you take us back to purchasing your first house, and I know you're you say you're a man of faith, you prayed about it. What are some of the tactical things you did coming from an impoverished situation? How were you able to shift kind of your thinking? to really start saying, I want to be able to attain these things. And how'd you kind of go about doing that? Yeah. So I was 20 years old. I was in the army national guard. I did not have a full-time job. At least I don't think I did. Probably not. I was very irresponsible, but they did let me in the national guard. And I had, I was, I was in what's called AIT advanced individual training. It's the place you go to learn your, your trade for the military. And I had, a paycheck coming in for that like four months. And then I had my one week cause I was in school for like four months, but then I had the one week in a month check coming in. And my mom, there was a realtor who was trying to help my mom cause I love my mom, but there's a lot of challenges there. And she was trying to help my mom buy a house. And the realtor said, your mom can't qualify, but if you're on the loan and you have this down payment, you know, Maybe, maybe we can qualify you. And that's back when money was a little bit easier to get, a lot easier right. to get. It's what caused the crisis <laughs> of 08. But I was able to get a house. She, she figured out a way for me to get qualified based on the money that I had and a little bit of income that I had coming in. I bought a brand new house. <laughs> brand new. First people to live in it. 20 years, 21 years old. And that's yeah. how I got in. And, and long story short, we ended up because – the pattern of behavior that, you know, my family was eventually none of us lived in that house anymore, but I still owned it because it was a lot of instability in my life. Okay. It's why we were very impoverished my whole childhood because that's just how we did business, but I owned the house. So I said, well, uh, I'm going to rent it just like in monopoly. And I remember I'd made a hundred dollars a month. I was like, that's a hundred dollars. I didn't have to work for. I loved it. And so I ended up over the course of time, I ended up buying two more houses, believe it or not, um, just over the course of me coming into money for different reasons. I came into a little bit of money and I was like, and then, you know, after you've rented a house for two years, they don't count that against you in the mortgage business. So it's been a couple of years. He's rented it out. We're not going to hold it against him. And so I was able to qualify for another house. I bought a second. I ended up having three houses by the time I was 25. And then, so when you say every two years, so let's slow down and and give people a little bit of insight. So was it from a second home standpoint so that you could qualify for? uh, I moved into it. I okay, moved into got it. it. So you were trying to avoid the capital gains taxes and. Yeah, I didn't sell. No, that's correct. Yeah, I I Mm -hmm. kept what I bought at 21. Okay. My next house is what, 24 maybe? <clears throat> and that thing I bought another one at 25. Okay. And so, but I would buy one. So when I moved out, I didn't exactly move into a house that I owned. We were kind of renting that kind of thing. Because remember, I come from an unstable world. So it won't exactly make sense the way that we did things. But what will make sense is I was able to buy another house. That yeah. was most, most important. Well, you to use me. the rental income. You have the ability to use the yes. rental income yes. from the first yes. one to qualify you for yep. the second one. Yep. And then whatever oh. little bit of money I was making from wherever, and I was National Guard. So that was a little bit of money. And all that little bit of money together, you know, came to 60 plus 40 percent of that mortgage plus 60 percent of leftover to qualify. And I got in. Yeah. And so I bought my second house and I bought my third house, which was a great buy. I paid $40,000 for this house. Wow. Um, because it was down the street from where my wife grew up and she knew the guy, the family knew her. like, I'll buy it. And she's like, well, we'll sell it for 40. So I went to a bank and, uh, they, I, I went to a traditional lender and they said, why would you move to a smaller house? That doesn't make sense to us. They wouldn't lend to me because they thought I was going backwards. They thought I was lying is basically what it was. Yeah. So I yeah. went to another bank and they said, well, we can do this type of loan for you. And you can get them like, cool, I'll take it. So I got three houses. So I'm 25 years old. So, uh, so I'm going to back GPA up because that's important. That's <laughs> yeah, important yeah. on just what are the what are the types of loans? Because I know that for yes. some, yep. you know, some banks don't want to, they, 
it doesn't make sense, especially when it's a second yeah. home uh, yep. and maybe you're purchasing yeah. it, trying to use residential financing um, mm -hmm. and you're trying to get a second home. Maybe it's 25 miles or more away from yeah. your one of your properties. You have that ability to apply for a second home, which is a very positive thing for people who are just getting in the game, may want to purchase a second property, but they don't want to have kind of an, an investor uh, rate. They want still kind of an owner occupied yeah. rate. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what were you able, when you got turned down by that first bank, what type of a loan were you able to get where they were able to help qualify you for, for that third property? Well, I remember the lender said, we will lend you money on this because where can you find a house around here that you can live in for 40,000? Right. And I said, I found one. So they basically, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what type of, that's a good question. I think it was maybe a 15 year amortization where they backed the equity of the house with, for the loan. So it was a community bank. It was a small bank. Got um, it. Perfect. And so, I don't remember how they structured it, but I know it wasn't a traditional. Do, you know, the beautiful thing, and you you tap on it a little bit, is those local banks yeah. are able to do yep. a lot more yep. creative things when you're not dealing with agency, yep. which is Fannie and yep. Freddie Mac loans. Yep. So yep. that's just one strategy for you know those that are on the call when you're when you yep. have a kind of a unique property that yep. a traditional Fannie Mae Freddie Mac agency type of a loan won't take down. Going to a local bank, going to a credit union, you may have a little bit more flexibility because they're the ones that are doing the underwriting for that particular loan. So yeah. I'll let you continue. And, and Sorry. It, it's okay. And it used to be that under 50,000, you couldn't get a loan. Like there's a right. base amount to borrow for, for real estate. And so yeah. under a certain value, you can't get one. At least that's how it was where I, where I was buying at the time. Yeah. And so they figured out a way to get me a loan. And so I bought it. So I have three houses. And uh, Hurricane Katrina hits, and two of my houses are not flooded, which wow. means I have prime real estate now. And I didn't realize what I had. I mean, I knew the values were going up. One of them did flood. I ended up selling it for thirty thousand, which I could have sold it for fifty, but I was young and had a lot of pressure on me because there was a lot of family drama going on. Remember, I'm still breaking free of. The the my story Toxic to create my own and stuff things like yes. that yeah very unhealthy dynamics and so if I would have had a, a mentor I would have walked away with another thirty to forty thousand but it is what it is I didn't lose money because the insurance wrote me out a check for fifty thousand and I sold it for thirty so I made seventy thousand dollars and I paid off the money that I owed to the bank so I walked away with like thirty grand or whatever was left over I, I can't remember but I made money. And then the other two houses are prime real estate. And this is a this is a great lesson. You want to own assets when things are falling apart. Because you might have an asset that goes up in value because everything around it is falling down, such as let a good storm go through Florida and destroy two-thirds of the homes. Those that are in good condition become worth a whole lot more. So, but if I didn't own the houses, I would be homeless in Louisiana with a hurricane destroyed area. And nothing, but I had yeah. two houses that turns out were in great shape. So I ended up eventually selling both of them. And now I have like $120,000. So here's this 1.2 GPA kid, 25 <laughs> years old, trying to figure out life. Don't even have a real job, like no career, no college, nothing. Married a great girl though. She loved me in all of this. I tell you what. And uh, I ended up deciding I want to go to college. So I moved to Georgia and I buy a house cash in Georgia. And it was a brand new house. I'm like, cool, my second brand new house. But this time I stepped on the back deck and it was all mine, all of it. Yeah. And it was so cool to stand on a deck of a, and it had a, just shy of an acre, nice new neighborhood. Wow. It feels good. And it was mine and I knew it. And I'm 25, about to start college. And I'm standing there on this back deck of my own house going, this is brand new and it's all mine. I still have that house today. I still have the house. Yeah. yeah. And um, I ended up using it to cash flow my way through college. It helped me pay for college. So here's some things that I learned. <clears throat> when, when you do the uh, FAFSA, they look for assets. They look for bank accounts, not real estate. 
if I would have had that money in a bank account, they would have held it against me. I would have had to pay out a cat. I would have had to pay cash from my bank account before I can qualify to get to whatever their requirements were to get you know help. Right. I didn't know that. I just was doing what I knew to do buy real estate. But looking once I learned the game, I'm like, wait a minute. So I have all that equity in a house, but it's not being held against me for fast. So I qualify bank for yeah. because it wasn't in a bank account. Yeah. And it spit off some money for me. Now I'm married with yeah. a kid going to college. My wife did not have a job. I'm a stay at home dad. Okay. And so that house cash flowed me through college and I worked. I, I painted houses. I did a lot of work. And my senior college, uh, well, my between my junior and senior, my wife had to have some major surgeries. We did not have health insurance because we're 25, 26. You don't need insurance. You're still young. Watch that, right? Two major surgeries, and now we can't have any more children. That's how serious the surgeries were. Well, turns out we know this gal who was uh, a member of our church. She ended up going some to Tennessee. I, this was, I, was, I went to college in Georgia. She moved to Tennessee. She's now pregnant. She says, I can't take care of my baby. And she, after a, a little bit of conversation, she asked my wife and I if we would adopt the baby. I said, if God gives us some money, we'll take the kids. And this is where I really started to learn the head, heart, hand alignment business. Because I'm now a homeowner with a house paid off before I started college. And I'm about to adopt my, I'm about to adopt a child while in college full time without a job. Yeah. And I did it. I didn't realize it until later on when I look back and go, who does that? You know, who adopts a kid while in school? And I had people right. telling me, you know, Hey, you know, you're, you, you, you know, you, you're living in someone's basement, which we did. We rented a basement apartment. We kept the expenses really low and there's a lot of principles in here. This is good stuff. We kept the expenses low. We were doing everything we could. We got out of college debt free, paid the whole way through, including housing and food for my wife and myself and my son. And my senior year, I adopted another child. He's now going to be 15 years old soon and paid cash for him. I say, I joke around, I say, pay a cash for you, you know, <laughs> but because you got to pay for it, you know. Right. And so sure. I graduated college. So my real estate helped cash flow me through. And but it's the principles that that really matter here of living below your means, buying investments. So what I was buying while I was in school was I was buying an investment in my education, but it's still buying an investment. I was investing Absolutely. not in real estate, but yeah. in me now. Yeah. And I'm very grateful. I went to school and got educated and I went to a great small school. They let me in. So anyways, but now I got a house, I ended up going to graduate school. In graduate school, I tell my wife and I start praying about buying a house. Who does that? We ended up buying a house, believe it or not, in Louisiana. I went back to Louisiana, did my graduate degree. Um, I prayed and asked God for $30,000. I know it sounds like one of those you know, semi-money preachers. That's not me. But <laughs> I did. I told my wife, I said, honey, I think we need our own front door. It's, I mean, we have one in Georgia, but we can't afford to live there. <laughs> We've never, <laughs> we couldn't afford to live in it. You know, because it was, well, we here's the money here's that the thing. Off, Here's you know? a really good thing. And I tell people when you buy right and circumstances happen, you should be able to move, rent it out and still feel yep. secure yep. that you'll be able yep. to cover that property, yep. whatever yep. in life might be happening. Yep. So, I mean, kudos yep. to you for buying it. I mean, you bought it cash, so it's cash flowing yep. you some, some, some value and some property. And now yep. you can go live below your means to do and adjust yep. to life as life is happening, right? Yes. And that money, I tell you what, that little seven, eight hundred bucks a month, nine hundred, it came in handy. I mean, I had to feed my wife, feed two kids. I'm in school. She's still a stay at home mom. Yeah. Money's tight. We were, you know, it, it was tight, but I owned a house and it was spitting off cash for me. That helped a yeah. lot. Yeah. So around midway, my so master's back in program. New Orleans now, right? I'm back in New Orleans. They've rebounded. Houses are now livable. Um, we, we, we end up getting 30 grand. We got about 17 grand through, I'm now in the air force reserves as a chaplain. Uh, well in the pipeline to become a chaplain. And I ended up getting some money from work that the air force sent me to do one summer. It was like 17 grand. My father-in-law said, I'll chip in the difference as a gift. We put a down payment on a house, five acres, Nice, really nice neighborhood. I'm like, I said, honey, don't tell them how much money we make. <laughs> I'm laughing, <laughs> you know, I said, until they see our car. But I bought another house. We stayed there for a few years and renting it out. Eventually I sold it. Eventually we paid it off, believe it or not. 
I paid that one off, which was a mistake. I probably should have not done that. Um, but and, and over the give course us a of, little insight on why you shouldn't have done that. What do you think is a trade off? Well, people my, always have the questions about yeah. whether to just let the debt, you know, yeah. pay the debt as the debt comes, or to just pay it yeah. in full and cash flow off yeah. of it. What What do you think you, was your reason there? So I I fell under the debt free for life camp and hurry up and pay off debt. And, and I've been on both sides of this. I've had two houses paid off, three houses paid off. I've had three houses paid off in my day. And looking back, I should have stayed in asset acquisition mode until I reached the point where I built wealth. Then I used the wealth to pay off the debt quickly. But I didn't so know that. that. I, so I had you, a different mindset. So you mean you would have uh, kept uh, kept your cash? Yep, and bought more houses to, to, yep. to be able we to would acquire be, more. We'd be, we would be seven times wealthier. Yeah, probably pushing eight million in net worth yeah. today. Yeah, if I would have if I would have kept buying, but I I chose to pay off because I had this you know and because remember I come from scarcity. So yeah. pay it off to have, then I don't have to worry about making money because that house is going to work for me. When now, reality no, is yeah. good. No, go ahead. Finish. When, when reality is I could have been buying up more assets, still made just as much money. And then I could use those assets to pay off all the debt, just yeah. debt snowball it. And but no, I didn't absolutely. know that there was, there was a season where I spent 18 months unemployed. Um, I'm now, I have three children. I've adopted two kids at this point. We have, I think it was three houses at the time and I did 18 months unemployed and that's where I learned. I, I worked, I was full-time military uh, as a reservist. I went to three years full-time, but afterwards you have to go back. They wouldn't keep you. There's rules for all of that. So I ended up being 18 months unemployed until I was able to pick up coming on to active duty permanently as an actual active duty officer and chaplain. So there's, there's rules to it. It, it is what it is, but I have 18 months unemployed and that's where I learned. I told my wife, I said, what we should have done, what I had a job is we should have been buying up everything we could get our hands on because I'm, we had a mini retirement. So I got to see the other side of my behavior. Yeah. I, I got to see, okay, this is what I did and this is all I have. So but how did I you shift? Hmm? Go ahead. Sorry. How did you shift that scarcity mindset? Cause now you own quite a bit of real estate now, right? Yeah, over and $2 so million you, of real estate. Yeah. Two and a half million. How did you, how did you make the shift? Do you talk about scarcity mindset? How did you make that shift to jump? And you talked about the head hearts alignment, hands yes. alignment. Yep. So maybe you can tap on, yep. just give, give our, yep. uh, audience a little bit of yeah. understanding on what that means and how that helps you to kind of overcome some of the scarcity mindset and really yeah. start accelerating in the area of real estate. No, that's good. So the, the mindset is my ability to see what could be and the way forward, the vision to actually make it happen. That's all in the head space. What's in the heart space is the I want and I don't want the I will and I will not. So we have the heart, the I will, I will not, and the mind space that makes sense of what's in the heart and looks around you to see what could be. And the hands go out there and build it. So you have all three factors that work here. My mindset really was rooted. My heart set of security was a heart issue. What if I don't have a job and I have all this debt? Then how am I going to, and I, and, I, and I lose my job, how am I going to eat? How am I right. going to take care of my family? And so that's what was driving. It was a fear, really. But So you really had to I shift went, what your heart was saying yes, in order to I get your mind called, to start believing a different story. Yes. I had what's called a corrective experience. And the corrective experience was I was unemployed. And I got to see what I was reaping by my behavior that before I was unemployed, like I had that retirement. I had, to, I literally went to my fear, fear place of not having a job, which by the way, I enjoyed. I mean, we really loved it. I say we prepared, it was 18 months of, and it wasn't fully unemployed. I did some, you know, I did some ministry things here and there, but it wasn't a full time. Yeah. Nothing yeah. was full time. So I did a little bit, you know, a little bit of income, but it was for the most part, I was unemployed. And, but because I was in, I, I had this opportunity to see what I, to reap what I was sowing while unemployed, I realized 
what I should have done, I said, man, if I would have been buying during those three years when I was on active duty, especially with real estate and what it's done since then, we would be yeah. much better off. And I told my wife, I said, next time we go back on active duty, I'm buying up as much as I can for as long as I can. Yeah. So, and my heart still doesn't fully like it, but I know the right answer Got is it. what we're doing. And I right. know I'll eventually get it all paid off, but I need to still be in acquisition mode. And thank God. And when people were telling me, why are you buying? I bought during the pandemic early on when rates dropped. I said, oh, I'm going shopping. And I had, you know, I refied houses and took cash out, bought up and, and then they'd appreciate it. I sold this, bought two here and I flipped the whole portfolio around to like brand new houses. Most of my houses, uh, let's see here, 50% of my portfolio is like less than two years old. Almost all of my rentals have brand new roofs and ACs on them. So, and, and, you know, so I have a really young, healthy portfolio that's producing really well, but I had to go through a mindset shift to say, no, I am going to build wealth. I'm going to carry the, the burden of the debt on me here. It took me a while to get to carry. I still don't like it, but, and I still want to pay it off, but I'm not, I said, I've given myself a timeline of asset acquisition then I'm going to pay it off because I have so to talk, employ. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. I have to employ what's in my mind, the, the knowledge base. And sometimes I have to use the knowledge base to help temper my heart because my heart has been tempered by the, the story that I was raised in that's created unhealthy things at the soul level of who I am. I still carry the burden of my childhood. I still, we all, it, it's still there. I have to learn to not let it drive my future. So right. I had to heal at the soul level. So this work we do, and this is, yeah, I think I mentioned, I, I have the, the show where I talk about head, heart, hand alignment inside the show. This is, matter of fact, I'm going to be rebranding the show from the Life of Money Coach podcast to this topic. We're going to talk about building wealth and relationships with head, heart, and hand alignment because you got to do work in your heart because sometimes you can have the opportunity in your hands and you won't seize it because your heart and your mind is getting in the way. Absolutely. So now that you kind of have this kind of aha, this awareness, you talk a little bit about your strategy on how you've been accelerating, especially over, I'd say, the last five years. It sounds, what strategy did you employ to start just accelerating? It sounds like you you may have um, you know bought some new properties so to kind of mm -hmm. keep the maintenance down and things like that. Yep. Can you talk yep. to a little bit to the strategy you, you deployed once you kind of got the aha yeah. and said, okay, let's go. Yeah, that's good. So I stuck to my knowledge base first. I didn't try crazy mm -hmm. things. I only bought what I knew and I had a certain criteria. I said, I want to make X amount of dollars a month the day I close on this property and how much I have to put down. I looked at how much I put down versus how much I make a year net after all expenses. And I had that number had to make sense to me. So I had a certain buy box, as we call it, a certain criteria yep. that would yep. determine if I buy. And when rates dropped, it made the it made the numbers work. Even though yeah. prices were going up, it doesn't matter. The payment is what drives the investment. What is that payment? And, and how much debt am I putting onto the property? And how soon yep. can I pay off that debt? So I had all of that factoring in like, okay, I have these. I can pay off this debt next amount of years. And I can debt snowball it from there. So I looked at that. I looked at how much is my income from, and I didn't expect rents to skyrocket like they did. I don't think nobody saw that, but no, definitely I said, not. <laughs> if they come down, I want to have enough cushion. So I still very conservative, yeah. but I had my, I wanted my income to be a certain income. I wanted my debt to equity ratio to be at a certain position. I wanted the houses to have certain criteria and I wanted them to be in a place where I could have one company that manages all of them. And I will own that company. Because I already know how to vet the tenants. And I know what it takes to take care of a house. So yeah. I send people to do that for me. So we strategically bought. And what my lender loved was she said, Jerry, I don't know how you do it. But every time you buy a house, your income goes up. So it's easier to yeah. qualify for another That's loan. That's how it should be. Absolutely. That's how it should be. I bought it. My income went up. So when you, you, you really have to be educated on the matter and be smart. I think. And you have to get started. You have to get started, but you, you can get burned in real estate. 
I've, I've never been burned. I've never been burned. Thank God I've never been burned. But some people went through a great recession and got really burned. For sure. Absolutely. Um, and I, I bought a house just before the recession. I bought my house, I think, in 05, 06, somewhere in there. And I almost sold that house. Almost sold it. And I, I thank God I did not because it is doubled in value. It's more than doubled in value now. Yeah. And I was well, able I think to pull you the deployed a lot of a, a lot of tactics of just the buy right strategy, and right. also starting with the end in mind, right? Like, yes, which is why I always ask yeah. people, okay, what is the strategy that you you mm -hmm. wanted to deploy? Because you started with, okay, here's okay, this is what I know now, and this is lessons and the blessings. So we count every mm. everything that you know we think we missed out on or we failed at. It's it it serves you in the end, right? And so you got that yeah. aha moment. And you made up for it, right? And so you yep. had the strategy yep. of kind of, hey, what's my debt to income going to be? What's the cash flow going to be? How yes. fast can I yes. debt snowball it? And all of that is really important to ensure you're not in a situation yep. where you're yep. like, you, you know, you're in a place where, okay, now you're foreclosing or now you have to short sell your house yeah. or you're yep. in a bind. Yep. I say, yep. tell people when you're, you know, in order to buy right, the numbers have to make sense. You have to cash flow so that in the the whatever instance that you are not able, maybe you lose your job, especially in a, in, in the yeah. nowadays where you know people are losing their job. There's there's a lot of layoffs happening. You want to know that you can move out that house, rent it, and the yep. going rent yep. in that area yep. covers your mortgage, all of the expenses, yep. and you have yep. a little you know safety nest after it's all said and done. And At if minimum. that can't happen, don't buy it, right? Like you yeah, should be exactly doing that right. analysis up front. Yeah. And uh, yeah. unfortunately, a lot of people will say, well, I can afford it instead of saying, you know, does it yeah. make sense so yeah. that if I move yeah. out and I can't afford it, the, the going rents can. Yeah. Can somebody else afford it? As a matter of fact, yeah. that's my first three houses. My philosophy was, I don't have to be able to afford this. Somebody else does. <laughs> and I would laugh at it. You know, my wife, they said, you shouldn't. And my wife, she's very, um, I'm the risk taker. You know, she's not so much. I'm yeah. like, well, honey, what's the worst thing to have? We'll just lose the house, you know? Uh, but we've never lost the house. But I'll tell you this. If you, you have to know how to run numbers and think well about this, because you can have a house that you think is great but you're really cash flow negative and, and it's it, well, right now things are appreciating fairly consistently across the U S some places, not so much right now, but across the U S there's still a lot of appreciation going on, even with rates at 8%, seven, 8%. But you want to make sure that you're not accidentally cash flow negative because you don't, you don't know how to look at numbers. So you have to be able to look at it and go, okay, what, what am I, what are all of my outgoes? including, you know, expenses like this year, we, we put out a lot of money this year into one house that I didn't see coming. That house is Lord Jesus, but we still have it. We still have it. And it's going to make me, it's, 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 it's good. It's, it's, yeah. it's better to fix the house up and keep it because of what I paid for it than to try and buy one a day. So it just makes sense to me to fix it. And I have a, a, a much newer house because I did all this work to it. So we decided to keep it, but you have to make sure that the house isn't cash flow negative. You want to make sure you actually understand your investment. This is where education comes in. If you're not careful, you can end up paying what Dave Ramsey calls the stupid tax. You can end up paying for it. But if you're educated and you can like the, like what Tara is talking about, Tara is talking about here, you, as long as you do the numbers right, it can be very it can be a powerful tool. And it has been for us. It's yeah. the reason why I am, I am where I am financially today. Absolutely. Now, now you're, you're, you're fast forward, you're in Italy now, right? So you've been stationed over there for uh, a couple of yeah. years. How are yeah. you, you talked about setting up a management group. How did you yeah. do that? And what made you come up with the idea to, to, to have someone managing your properties from afar? And your portfolio well, think, is, is now what? How many properties do you have uh, in how many states? Nine single family manage? units, okay. nine single family in Georgia. Okay. Yeah. And so, I, well, first of all, I'm not a huge fan of property management companies. I remember I, I went when I when I was living there, I went to one property manager. I won't say the brand because I don't want to get sued for slander or something. But <laughs> I promise you, you've seen them on TV and everywhere else. But I went to the the that particular branch 
and I said, Hey, what could, what do you think I could rent my house out for? It was $250 less than what I thought I can get for it. And then I ended up renting out for a hundred dollars more than I thought I could get for it. So it'd be $4,000 if I rent it. And then I got to pay a fee to that person. Right. And then so I, I looked at another person and they have a bunch of rentals kind of spread all over the place. I'm like, so you're not going to pay no attention to my rental. I said, I know people around here. I'll get them to go do it for me. And so we did. And, but what, but the, the reason I actually formed, formed the company was twofold. One operations, if there's a liability piece. So if the company gets sued because of something, the company's assets is what they could take. And that, that company has no assets. So it's an operating company that stays pretty much poor. So that's one reason. But the second reason is I needed credibility because people were going up to houses and yeah, and wanting money. You know, my, my vendors, my, my, my uh, representatives were going out to these houses to show them. And they're like, well, what company are you with? Oh, well, you know, and so I had to put a degree of like validity to it. You know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. right, I had to put something to where they could Google it and say, okay, this is a real company, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. And where they could maybe see my face and see, you know, people who work for me, their face on the Facebook page. And, and then they could, you know, go to the, the state website because people have done this. They'll, they'll Google the company name to see that I'm active duty military and own the company. They'll tell me, oh, I see your, so they'll, because people are smart. They don't want to get scammed. So I just went ahead and put it all over on the company. It's what we do. It's a little part-time thing that I do, you know, on the side. And then it gives the validity that people need to have trust because they're very selective on the tenants that we put in our properties. It is a yeah. very high trust relationship. If, if I feel like we can't trust you, you're not getting in. Did you lie on your application? Something's not adding up on what you said. You know, sure. you know, you be very honest with us and be honest with you. Our slogan is quality homes to qualified tenants. And we take both very serious. But that's, that's how stuff. I got so, to. So you employed management. your relationships that you already had in that yeah. state um, yep. in order to yeah. to operate mm -hmm. the, the, the yeah. properties from afar. So. Yeah. So is it checkbook, uh, checkbook money at just, just the checks come in. You don't yeah, have to, it's very hands much. off. Here. You know, I, I will, I get hands on when we're putting a tenant in the property. I get hands on there. Um, maintenance issues. I kind of still manage those. Even though I, I could sub those out. It's never nothing major, never anything major. So, you know, I have a guy who goes out to do it. I got another guy I'm about to try out. I got, I got a whole list of who I call for what. So it's just a matter you of calling. And you got to have a long bill. list of vendors just in case. Uh, I got a long list. Good. Electricians, yeah. plumber, roof, carpentry, painter. And if they ever don't do a good job, I'll remove it from the list, find somebody else. Yeah. So it's not completely hands off, but um, I, I still enjoy it. I know what it's doing for me. It's taking me and my family to another level financially. Um, it's, I don't mind the time that I do put into it. Would I want to be a hundred percent hands off? It'd be nice, but I'm too cheap to pay someone to do it right now. So <laughs> I pay myself because it's not a bad deal, you know? Yeah. And so, but yeah. yeah. So this wouldn't be lessons into blessings if we didn't talk about, and, and we talked a little bit about it, just all the lessons that you've learned, maybe the failures mm -hmm. or the setbacks that you've had. If you, if you really look at it, you can always make lemons into lemonade. And so we, mm -hmm. we talk about kind mm -hmm. of how we've had lessons over our life period that have transitioned into blessings. What are some tips that you can give our viewers to kind of end the show off with? Um, tips where you may have things you've learned from maybe your setbacks in real estate or your setbacks in life that have, that have really turned into blessings now that you're mm -hmm. accelerating your success and your financial freedom <clears throat> through real estate. Principle applied over time. That's one of the principles I talk about on my show all the time. And it's so true. We are where we are because we have consistently applied financial principles and relationship principles and our faith journey principles, all of which go together, by the way, consistently over time. I like to say it's a lot like sowing a seed or sowing some seeds and you nurture the soil and you water it and it begins to grow. And then you, you begin to see the fruit of the seeds that you've sown and the effort. 
But there comes a point where that seed that became this little bitty bush becomes a little bitty tree that becomes a tree. And you, before you know, it, you got like, give it 15 years, you got yourself deep roots, big tree, like, whoa, that I remember when I planted that seed. But what's interesting is this, the seeds from the fruit from that tree fall to the ground with the fruit, you know, the fruit falls to the ground with the seeds inside. Yeah. And you can't eat all the fruit. So you start giving some away. Now you're becoming in a life of abundance, but it gets even more precious. Give it another 10 years and the seeds that fell down with that fruit to the ground, the wind blew the seeds. And then over time it germinated into the ground, healthy soil, and the tree grew from a seed that you didn't sow. Right. And now you've got trees growing you've got you've got abundance all around you that's the abundant life all because of consistent principle over time and when you veer off track turn around quickly when your heart starts to go the wrong direction turn around quickly go back to the good stuff go back to the good life keep sowing it and you over time you consistently join the day there don't mm -hmm. borrow money for anything except the house. Sow good seeds in your relationships. Sow good seeds in your faith journey with God. And over time, the results of that, it doesn't matter where you start. The results will be, wow, how did I get here? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, absolutely consistency. Relationships are critical. I'm a oh, believer yeah. as well. So for me, faith is critical. And oh, yeah. um Definitely consistency because oh, everything yeah. is seed time harvest. Everything that you know, you sow it, you reap it. But yep. there's this thing in the middle that's time, and we don't know yeah. when the time is going to happen when the the fruit comes up from the things we've sown. But if we're consistently sowing, then we'll be consistently reaping at some point that's in time. It. That's it. Yeah, that's it. You know, but we're Jerry always Dick sowing. Yeah. We're we're always sowing. The question is, what are we sowing? And I learned this years ago. So it's my little slate, my little saying now. I say, so you reap what you sow. And so I sow what I want to reap. There you go. I reap what I it's sow. Real talk. So I sow what I want to reap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jerry, <laughs> thanks for coming on the show, man. We appreciate you. Uh, we'll shoot people some information about uh, your podcast, the, Li the Life Money yeah. Coach. And, Life and Money um, Coach, yep. Yeah. But thanks for, you, for joining us all the way from Italy. We appreciate you. You're welcome. And for and those folks, people listening. Yeah, go ahead. So, say it again. I was going to say, I was going to give my Instagram if folks wanted to find me on Instagram or YouTube. Yeah, we, we were, uh, I was going to shoot it. Yep. Go for it. Oh, God. Okay. I was ahead of you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, you can find me at Jerry St. Pierre Official on YouTube and Instagram. So, Jerry St. Awesome. Pierre Official. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And until next time, everyone stay blessed. <music>